Welcome to the Tough Fish Show. I am so excited to bring to you Antoinette Trulio Martin. Antoinette, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for the invite. I'm very excited. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. And I would love for you to start with how did you get into writing? Well, as a child, I always wanted to be a writer when I and um, I used to write little stories and terrible poems, and my parents thought they were wonderful, uh, <laughs> and my grandmother as well. <laughs> but when it came time to, um, you know, think of a college career and everything, I, I was really not permitted to pursue it because uh, it wasn't practical. And, you know, I'm a child of the 70s, 60s and 70s, so you needed a practical path. And, um, and back then I was given three choices. I could be uh, a teacher, a social worker, although my father did, wasn't sure what that person does, and, and an engineer. He, he, he was an engineer, so he, would want, he wanted one of his kids to be an engineer. <laughs> so, or a nurse. That was the other one. I, I can't do blood. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I went with teaching. My mom's a teacher, so I went with teaching. I became a speech therapist. So what was the passion in particular with writing though? Was it just, was it because um, of- I found over the years that, um, especially keeping a journal, um, it, it gave me a voice. I'm, I'm not really very uh, witty in conversations and stuff. So the uh, journals gave me a voice and it gave me a chance to rehearse and reflect on what I was doing. And then I'm, I'm finding I'm actually able to kind of spin some stories out of my observations, uh, you know, have maybe a little different perspective on, uh, on a, an event, uh, that, that sort of thing. So, and I was very comfortable with the written word. Um, nice, you know, nice. Yeah, you know, I could paint, you know, I wasn't a singer. Uh, <laughs> So, but the written word was, uh, was more, more suited to me. I love that. And I, I'm a big believer in journaling too. To me, it's, yes. it's very cathartic and it helps you to process mm -hmm. sometimes, like you were saying, and the, the sheer fact that you could write and then reflect upon it. I mean, you're doing a lot right through that whenever, even if you're journaling just for yourself versus I'm right. trying to flesh out this idea for a book or mm -hmm. for a character or what have you, it's still helping in those moments too so i right. i love that you leveraged uh journaling so much that's yeah, great and, um you know there were a lot there's there's so many programs on journaling and everything i can never really structure it enough because some people would have a book for their story ideas some for their dream thing dream uh thoughts others for almost like a therapeutic thing it's like i can't carry three books around at once <laughs> So, so my journals tend to be just, you know, a conglomeration of ramblings. And, um, but I do go back to them, you know, I do find them, uh, you know, and I, I'll, you know, like I said, it's, it, it's also gives me a, a point of rehearsal. Yeah. So if I need yeah. to approach anything. I, I have like a little script ready to go. I love that. But I think that that's because you, sometimes you need that little bit of, I, I've, thought this through to figure out how this, what helps me to be comfortable so that I am showing up in my best space. And then that, if that helps in that way, I think that's wonderful. I love that guidance. I love that. I love that you do that. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Now I know you have degrees in writing, like a creative writing degree, but what I'd love for you to talk a little bit about like going from speech therapist and such into writing just I know you wrote mm -hmm. a memoir. I know you've written for middle grade, but what, and, and picture books even. So would you talk a little bit about that transition? Well, um, like I said, I was always writing and being a speech therapist, um, you're, you're managing language. You're looking at language all the time. And, and I've always loved working with kids and, you know, doing the play and observing their play. And um, so I, I drew a lot of inspiration from just being with small children and then, of course, with my own kids and nieces and nephews. Um, so the first picture book was inspired by my little girl playing at the beach. 
playing on the beach and um and you know so i kept on rolling out all these story ideas and fleshing out the language and the cadence and um my my biggest uh thing that i found that was so helpful was finding a writers group and uh being able to channel their energies and their expertise into what I was doing. And then wouldn't you know it, people like my ideas for their work, you know, so it was a, it was a way to grow with it. And um, I did that for a long time. And um, in, and I kept writing in the journal, um, you know, raising the kids, keeping a home. But in 2007, I had uh, cancer and I had to go through a whole, year of chemotherapy and radiation and uh you know came out the other end fine um and i had kept you know a, a a journal just for that and i had and then at the end i'm thinking i'm gonna write this whimsical cancer story and each time i tried to start it i just couldn't do it yeah and um but then about five years later i was re-diagnosed with stage four so I felt I needed to get something written down, if, if anything, uh, for my daughters. So, um, and that was about the time I went for my MFA. I was encouraged mm-hmm. to write it as a memoir and guide it through. And um, that's how the memoir came about. But I did learn a big lesson when, when you write. Mm. You really, and, and you want to publish you really need to like talking about your subject. You gotta, you gotta like talking about it, writing more articles and essays about it, blogging and talking to other people about it uh, in order to keep the book alive. Um, and I found after I wrote my, uh, my memoir, Hug Everyone You Know, I really didn't like talking about it. Mm. You know, there's one thing I could keep it, keep the words on paper, and let other people read it. But um, you know, to to have to to have to stand up and almost be like an authority on on the subject, I I didn't feel that was my place. And um, you know, I, I was even a keynote speaker for Susan uh, Coleman uh, wow. chapter here, and I really didn't like it. So. But but I think that's just as important. Like you don't sometimes you don't know what you don't like until right. you, you've tried it and. This, you were writing this book for a different reason at first. And, and it sounds mm-hmm. like it's still, it honors the original reason that you had. It honors that space. But that doesn't mean that you can't take that lesson and apply it to something else. That's I, right. Mm-hmm. And I love that you've wrote, and I love how you describe it for, from a, a wimpy patient. And I'm thinking to myself, That's me. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I, I, I think it's brave to go through what you have. So to me, you know, to, to, make it playful like that. I think that makes it relatable because probably anyone else going through something so challenging would feel like, am I being, you know, this just feels frustrating. You're like, yeah, I get Mm. you. I understand. (laughs) So yeah. 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 It it, it, it has its place in my, in my journey. It does have its place. But um, after that, you know, I decided I'm, I'm not going to do memoir anymore. You know, I do enough I do enough um, musings and everything through my blog. So um, I decided to go back to kid lit, children's literature. Yep. And that's where the middle grade story came from. So the background with that is that um, besides writing all the time, I'm a, I'm a very good listener of stories. And uh, my family, it's, we, I, I come from a very big, large, loud Italian family. And, and over dinner and over the, ta- you know, around the table, stories are hashed out and they're rehashed and they're retold and more clarification or, or some such lore, you know, it's, it's almost like a fairy tale. Um, so I, um, I, I, I structure a lot of uh, stories around a storytelling uh, model. Uh, the, the, the stories in the Becoming America's uh, story series uh, com- come f- from my grandmothers. Uh, I, I took 
my one grandmother, her life as a child in uh, the Lower East Side of New York City in, in the early 1900s. And I sprinkled in some, some other family stories in there to, to mesh it all in. And um, I have to tell you, it was so much fun writing this. You know, I got to, I got to research. Uh, yeah, I went to the New York Public Library. I went to the Tenement Museums. For this, for the second book that just came out two days ago, I don't have a full, I don't have a real book yet, but. Ah, I got the mock-up, yes. <laughs> I got a mock-up right now, yeah, when I did all my edits. <laughs> um, I went to the Henry Street Settlement. I made phone calls. I sat down with my parents, with my aunts and uncles. And I'm so fortunate I have an aunt who is uh, like 95 years old. And she is, her, her memories are so clear. And she tells beautiful stories. And... Um, so, so this is where the middle grade uh, st story came from. But I chose middle grade because I think it's important for children at this age, between you know age eight to 12, 13, to have a connection to their ancestors, even if it's just like one generation old, but, but to have a means to um, ask questions and compare you know, their play to the way their grandmother played or the way their father played. Um, that's what they, so, so many rich lessons come from it and um, perspectives where um, you get you get a real, real understanding as to where they came from. You know, they, they're not just mean old people. <laughs> <laughs> They're not, they haven't been adults the whole time. They might've been adults the whole time you knew them, but they, yeah, they, they were children too. So yeah. They were children. And I think at this age, this, this little period of time, this middle grade age is so perfect to uh, be able to extend their thoughts, you know, in a before time, before they were. So, you know, anything. I love that you've done this because what you have just talked about too is how, you know, you can transition from different genres and it still mm -hmm. stays true to what you're talking about or what you're about like a golden theme a golden thread type of messaging mm -hmm. but yet you can have different facets like you I, I have multiple books as well published but in the same and different genres but still there's that thread and I love that you've just described that through what you've done and the fact that they're all still tied to family that there's stories that there there's that connection element I think that that's beautiful and I love the point that you've made about leveraging your listening skills, because so many times as a writer, you might be thinking about how, how are you doing with literally putting pen to paper and writing or what have you, or crafting the story or the scene, or did you do enough research? But part of your research, part of your, your creativity could come just by being present in a different moment, a moment with family, a moment somewhere else. And and listening to what's going on and, and seeing how does this information kind of weave in or inspire or what have you. So. Right. Right. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. And it's also important too, when you're talking about dialogue, because when yes. you, when you are, it's one thing to read dialogue, but at least, and especially, and when I'm editing, especially others works, I'm reading it out loud because it, mm -hmm. it should, it's going to sound different the way you would communicate. So the fact that you're talking about leveraging those listening skills also helps to make sure your dialogue is feeling pretty good too. Right. You know, I, I, I find it very, I, the, the whole writing process gets very interesting when you start really, you know, fleshing out the story and putting it down. And um, cause you don't want it to sound like it's, it's still in your head. <laughs> Right. It's, it's, it's a very different story when it's just you playing it out in your head. Um, you, you, but when it's on paper with written words and punctuation and uh, paragraphing, you get a cadence and you get a, you get a real uh, rhythm going so that the story will flow as if somebody had told the story fluently. Absolutely. I love that. That is so well said. And I'd like for you to t uh, go into a little bit more, if you would, about the research, because uh, especially when you're writing historical fiction, 
yes, it might be fiction, but when it's historical fiction, you're, you're having to blend truths and, and uh, things that have happened in some capacity, mm -hmm. but then build the rest of the world. So it is also a form of world building that you're doing. Would yeah. you talk a little bit about that? Yes, the world building um, is, is so important. I, um, you know, because I, I live on Long Island, New York City is not too far away. And I got myself into the city, took the subway and walked the blocks that my characters would have walked. It looks very different now. The neighborhoods are very different from when it was a hundred years ago, but I walked the blocks. I actually walked to see how long does it take to get to the park that I need to get to, you know, or, or where was the public school? And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking up records, uh, Curricula, uh, yeah, I found out, you know, what the children actually studied when they oh. went to school. Yeah. Um, I, I th these things give a real flavor and, uh, and a bit of authority to, to the actual story. I, I also looked up, you know, what kids wore and not just the high fashion kids, you know, the kids with means, these were the poor immigrant children. What were they able to uh, wear and how did they share their clothing? That, that sort of thing. How do they go food shopping? How do they keep food in the house? And um, I went on the Tenement Museum tours. Wonderful, if you're ever in New York, that's a, a must-see tour. Um, first time I went, I took my mother who has always claimed she doesn't really remember her childhood so much. But when we went in and we saw the artifacts and we saw the way uh, the people lived and everything. She says, oh, this is what my mother talked about. This is what my grandmother meant. You know, all these little, the, the way the stove was, was set up and the clotheslines on top of it. She says, yeah, that now, you know, that, that she, things triggered. And then she came up with all these stories. It's like, oh my God. It, it was a, uh, yeah, so it was it was really um, it was really a hands-on, kinesthetic, meaty type of research uh, for the first book. The second book, I was dealing with public health nursing, the beginnings of public health nursing, being able to care for this family that um, was going to come into some health issues. Uh, and the Henry Street settlement is still in existence. It's uh, uh, about 130 years old now. They were wonderful. They brought me on a house tour in the middle of this COVID thing. And they uh, showed me the artifacts and gave me better, you know, some real good stories as to what went on in the house. I needed to know where the kitchen was so I could have this, these characters move through. And um, because I wanted to be really true to, um, I, I really wanted to be true to, true to fact. And, and I also looked up uh, the founder, Lillian Wald of the Henry Street Settlement. And, um, and I put her in a fictitious uh, situation, but I think I was pretty true to her personality. And I read her books, read the articles about her. So I did a lot of research. But, uh, and, and the research gave, gave the story a little more of a different direction in some parts, um, a, a little different flavor than when I had originally thought I would write, but I think it's a little more authentic. I love that. I love that. So if you would, I know that this is a series, but did you, when you conceptualize this initial story, was it? A standalone or did you already know that you wanted it to be a series or was it one of those that it as it started to develop and more and more and you started getting more excited about it that you started to see where it could have legs and you know turn mm -hmm. into one I would love for you to talk a little bit about that well originally the first story uh came out and was titled daily bread and I took that story from my grandmother when she was 10 years old, she got to bake bread at the Jewish bakery. Uh, and uh, the, the baker was very kind. And every morning she would go in to set the dough, come back at lunchtime, knead and shape it. And then at the end of the day, she would get her loaf of bread for three cents instead of five cents. 
And uh, so that was her contribution of being a big kid. So they were, the, the baker's wife was a little odd. She would dance around and she would give the children rolls for breakfast and for lunch. They didn't have children. So when my grandmother brought the little sister in, this woman was like so like thrilled to have this little girl. Oh, and, she, and my grandma says, and it was only because she was so pretty. <laughs> but, um, but she was very tall for her age so she could reach the baker's table. So the, the baker's wife said she could bake and she was a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> and she would spill things because she was only, you know, eight years old. <laughs> she wasn't a big kid. So that's how I, I spun the story around that story that my grandmother used to tell. But then how did you turn it into the series? Did it, was it one of those that it kind of evolved over time? Or did you already have the idea that you wanted a series? To I, I really didn't have the idea when the publisher agreed to, uh, to do the first story, she said, well, I need two more books. Oh, you know, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> so uh, so uh, I've been in a little bit of overdrive. <laughs> Understood. But, but again, you know, it was because I did some, I, I was doing so much research for the first book. There was just so much there. Now I could save it all. I could, I could spread it out. Uh, for the other two books so it did work out I still have to get book three going <laughs> you do, but I mean I love that because it it does sound then like someone that went the way it started and um, here's my cat deciding to join us at the moment oh I God, you know, I put mine outside <laughs> so but with um but it does sound like it was one of those where you just really were so excited and that the joy was coming through. And mm -hmm. when you're, like you said, your publisher read it, it's like, ah, uh, we need a couple more books out of this. I think that that's such a compliment to what you were doing because yeah, it's created a little pressure in its own way. But I also think that this is a compliment to say that, that it was, it was lovely. It was enjoyable. It was, it was a, something you want to keep going and where can this go? What will happen to your characters? What, what kind of right. uh, you know, path do they have? I think that that's beautiful. Congratulations to that. That's cool. Thank you. <laughs> I think that's awesome. So actually, so how can people connect with you and how can get, they get these books, regardless if it's for middle grade or they might be struggling with a, their own cancer journey or know someone mm -hmm. who might, how can they connect with you? How can they get your books? Okay, well, I'm, uh, I'm online with my website. It's www.storyserved.com. And uh, the little sidebar has where you can get the books. But you can also just go to Amazon, uh, look up the titles, or just look up my name, Antoinette Trulio Martin, and the books should all line up. Awesome, awesome. Antoinette, thank you so, so much for being thank on the you. show. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you were here. <laughs>